the Anglo-Boer War, as witnessed by Denis Reitz, and written in his book Commando, a Boer War Journal of the Boer War, by Denis Reitz. Chapter 10. The rest of our corporalship is destroyed. For a while, the success at Spiunkop went to our heads, and we thought that the English would be sure to make peace. But again the days came and went with no sign. Indeed, we presently heard that General Buller was back at Colenso, collecting an ever larger army to attack again. But we were confident that the Tugela defences would hold, and we saw no shadow of the disasters that were soon to overtake us. After a week, my brother Hubert returned from Pretoria. He said that he and the escort had been made much of by the townspeople, for coming straight from the battle on the hill, they were the heroes of the hour. And they were marched down to shake hands with President Kruger, the nearest approach to battle honours that we ever attained. He arrived in camp with my three remaining brothers. The eldest, Yalmar, aged 20, was studying law in Holland when the war broke out, and he had, after considerable difficulty, succeeded in reaching the Transvaal through Portuguese territory. The other two, Arndt and Jack, aged 16 and 12 respectively, had been at school up to now. But they had at last persuaded my father to let them come to the war. Jack only remained for a few days, as old Marula, on one of his visits to our lager, caught sight of him and ordered him to be sent home. But at any rate, from now onward, there were four of us in our tent. About the middle of February, a force of 800 mounted men was drawn from different commandos for the purpose of carrying out a raid into Zululand. The exact object of this expedition I never heard, but I think that it was intended to create a diversion for the British were massing heavy at Colenso. My, my two newly arrived brothers were absent on a visit to the Tugela, for commando life was a novelty to them, and they spent much of their time riding about, but my brother Hubert and I joined the Zululand column. It assembled at the uh, Commandant General's headquarter, headquarters, behind uh, Bulwana Hill, and we started the same morning under Old Marula. For several days we travelled due east through lovely mountain country, everywhere dotted with picturesque native crawls. The Zulus showed no fear of us and refused to serve as guides, for they sided with the British, as they have always done. Of English troops we saw no sign, and our journey was a rest, restful interlude after the excitement of the past few weeks. Unfortunately, it soon came to an end, for about the fifth day out, a messenger came riding post-haste with orders for Marula to return to Ladysmith at once. We retraced our steps by forced marches arriving back at, at the head lager on about the eighth day after leaving. During the last two days of the journey, we heard a constant rumble of gunfire coming from the direction of Colenso, and on reaching our Pretoria camp, we were met with the disturbing news that the English had broken into our, into our defences there to the extent of capturing Thlangwani Hill a commanding position that was considered the key to the Tugela line. Once more, volunteers from every commander around 
the town were called for and my two brothers, Hjalmar and Arendt, had returned and gone off again on some jaunt. So Hubert and I, with the rest of Isaac Nolherber's corporalship, handed in our names. There was no difficulty in getting the required 50 men, and at dusk, on the day after our return from Zululand, we set out on a journey from which few were to come back. We rode through most of the night in company with other units hurrying to the danger point. Farther on, we fell in with small parties riding in contrary direction, who made no secret of having quitted the Tegela firing line. And when we neared the river at daybreak, we found a critical situation. Not only had Tlongwani been taken, but every Boer trench on the north bank, for a distance of several miles, had been evacuated. And what was far more serious, there was a feeling of discouragement in the air that dismayed us. Up to now, the prevailing note in the Natal had been one of confidence in an early peace. But almost a night, and without apparent cause, a wave of pessimism had set in, and the nearer we came, the more evidence was there of growing demoralization. Hundreds of men were leaving the new line that had been formed in the hills, behind the abandoned trenches. They were dispersing about the back area, some holding meetings, others making for the wagon loggers in the rear, and from their talk and attitude, we snuffed disaster. For though we knew before starting that Thlongwane had been taken, we did not know that the fighting spirit of the men had gone with it. Bad as it looked, however, things were not yet quite hopeless. For General Boerta had taken up a new line to the rear of the old one, and was once more standing on the defensive, with eight or nine thousand men. We were met by one of his officers, who allotted different points to the various fresh detachments. We of the Pretoria commando were told to leave our horses in uh, charge of guards and march on foot down a rocky gorge, which led towards the Tegela. Heavy lidite shells crashed against the cliffs on either side as we went down. But we emerged, emerged without uh, loss at the lower exit of the canyon to find ourselves in the bed of a dry sprite, which ran across an open plain to, which, uh, uh, to where it joined the Tugela River, about a mile and a half away. This dry bed skirted along the base of the foothills for some distance before bending away across the plain, and from exit of the gorge to the point where it curved away, its bank had been converted into a sector of the new line. We were assigned a position near the top end, not far from where we had come out of the gorge, and we fell to it at once. Hacking firing steps with pocket knives and um, any other implements on which we could lay our hands. The English infantry were 800 yards off, approximately along the line of our former trenches that had been abandoned two days before. From here, they were maintaining a continuous uh, rifle fire. A multitude of bullets whizzing overhead or plunging into the ground in front of us. They were also methodically shelling the course of the sprite with many guns, including high-angle howitzers, so that we were in a very warm and unpleasant locality. The casualties were few, owing to the height of the bank, and not one of the Pretoria men was hit, 
although I got a shell splinter through my hat before I had been there 10 minutes. And one or two of our men had scratches from flying earth as the shells exploded on the uh, bed um, of the sprite below. The British did not attack on our front, but later in the morning made a determined, determined attempt to our left against some hills known as Peter's Heights, where the uh, Bethel Commando was posted. We saw waves of infantry going forward, but it was too far off for us to participate. At first the soldiers advanced in irregular lines, but gradually their progress was stayed, and we could see the survivors crouching behind rocks and stones. They lost heavily, and it was soon evident that the attack had been repulsed. Nothing further happened that day, and by dark all was quiet. We spent an undisturbed night, and next morning, which was February the 26th, 1900, the English sent in, under flag of truce, to fetch away our, uh, their dead and wounded, so that there was no firing at all. Having nothing to do, my brother and I walked down to watch the removal of uh, the, the, fall, the fallen soldiers. We spent some hours going over the ground discussing uh, events with the English doctors and stretcher bearers. Returning up the sprite on their way to our own qu uh, quarters, we met my Hollander uncle, still serving with the Swaziland police. A chance encounter, which po probably saved our lives, of both, both of us. My uncle, seeing us pass, asked us to spend a day or two with him. And falling in, in with his suggestion, we went to get our things and to tell Isaac Malherba where we were going. He made no objection to our visiting the Swazilanders, seeing that they were close by. And he promised to send for us should he need us, or should we be wanted. As we were going off, he looked at us with his quiet smile and said, Be sure and come quickly, should I send word. For how shall I hold this bank without you two boys beside me? He was referring to the night below Surprise Hill, but we never again saw him alive nor any of the others. Carrying our cooking tins and blankets, we returned to the Swaziland police. At sunrise next morning, the English started, started in real earnest to bombard the Sprite. All day long, they shelled us with light and heavy guns. While we hugged uh, the sheltering bank, shrapnel and lidite uh, crashed upon us, causing a heavy, great many casualties, and we suffered a terrible ordeal. Considering the de demoralization that had set in, the men stood the bombardment well. There were some who retreated up the gorge, but there was no general desertion, and when at sunset the fire died down, our forces were holding firm after one of the worst days of the war. This heavy shelling was the obvious preparation for an, for an attack the next day. So my brother and I, when the fire slackened, went up, went up to find the Pretoria men. In the dusk we made our way along the bed of the Spreit, past groups of burghers standing around their dead, or wounded, and other groups discussing the incidents of the day. But when we came to where we had left our companions the evening before, they were gone. And we were told by those nearby that they had marched up the gorge an hour ago for some other point of the line. We could not understand why Isaac had not let us know but thought that his messenger had missed us in the failing light. We were upset by his departure and decided to follow after at once. 
So we went back to tell my uncle of our intention. He said he was coming with us too, as he had been thinking of a change for some time and would like to join the Pretoria Commando. Accordingly, he told his field cornet of his plans, and the three of us set off through the gorge. It was pitch dark by now, and we had a difficult climb up the boulder-strewn uh, bed, stumbling and groping our way as best we could. When at last we reached the top, uh, uh, the, the entrance, we were so weary with the heavy loads we were carrying, and there was so little chance of finding our uh, corporalship at that time of night, that we flung ourselves down on the first piece of level ground and slept until daybreak. As soon as it was light, we made out the tents of the horse guards, where we found our saddles just as we had left them, and our horses grazing not far away. These guards were here on permanent duty to look after the animals of the burghers in the firing line. And they told us that Isaac Malherba and his party had spent the night with them and had ridden off before dawn to join the Bethel commando at, at Peter's Heights, some miles uh, east of us. So we hurriedly cooked a meal and, uh, saddling our horses, rode after him, following behind the, the range of hills that formed the Boer line. As we went along, a, a bombardment more violent than that of, the, of yesterday broke out ahead of us. And when we came to the rear of Peter's Heights, we saw the ridge on which lay the Bethel men and our own going up in smoke and flame. It was an alarming sight. The English batteries were so concentrating on the crest that it was almost invisible under the clouds of flying earth and fumes, while the volume of sound was beyond anything that I have ever heard. At intervals, the curtain lifted, letting us catch a glimpse of the trenches above, but we could see no sign of movement, nor could we hear whether the men up there were still firing, for the din of the guns drowned all lesser sounds. We reined in about 400 yards from the foot of the hill, at a loss what to do. To approach our men through that inferno was to court destruction, while not to try seemed like desertion. For a minute or two, we debated, and then suddenly the gunfire ceased. And for a space, we caught the fierce rattle of Mauser rifles, followed by British infantry swarming over the skyline, their bayonets flashing in the sun. Shouts and cries reached us, and we could see men desperately thrusting and clubbing when a rout of burghers broke back from the hill, streaming towards us in disorderly flight. The soldiers fired into them, bringing many down as they made blindly past us, not looking to right or left. We went too, for the troops, cheering loudly, came shooting and running down the slope. Of our Pretoria men, who had been on the ridge, not one came back. They had been holding an advanced position to the to the right of the Bethel section and uh, had been overwhelmed there. They stood their ground until the enemy was on them and they were bayoneted or taken to the last man. Thus our corporalship was wiped out with its leader, Isaac Malherba, the bravest of them all. and. Their going at this calamitous time was scarcely noticed, for this day marked the beginning of the end in Natal. The British had blasted a gap through which the victorious 
soldiery came pouring, and wherever we looked, Boer horsemen, wagons, and guns went streaming to the rear in headlong retreat. We followed the current, hemmed in by a great th a throng, all making for the various fords of the Clip River. And it was lucky, indeed, that the English sent no cavalry in pursuit, for the passages across the river were steep and narrow, and there was frightful confusion of men and wagons struggling to get past. By nightfall, my uncle and my brother and I had managed to cross, and as it started to rain, we annexed a deserted tent behind Lombardskop, picketed and fed our tired horses and slept there till morning. We, we now resumed our journey as far as uh, the headed lager, where we slept a dismal hour or two watching the tide of defeat roll north northward. We knew that the siege of Ladysmith would have to be raised, and now came the news. While we were halted here, that Kimberley had also been relieved, and that General Cronier had been captured at Pardeberg with 4,000 men, so that the whole universe seemed to be toppling about our ears. From the way in which the commanders were hurrying past, it looked that morning as if the Boer cause was going to pieces before our eyes, and it would have taken a bold man to prophesy that the war had still more than two long years to run. We hung about the dismantled head lager till midday, after which the three of us rode on gloomily to the Pretoria camp, arriving towards five in the afternoon. Word of the disaster to our men on the Tegela had already preceded us as is the way with evil tidings, and it was not known that my brother and I had escaped. Our unexpected appearance caused a sensation, men running up from all sides to hear the truth. My other brothers had returned, and their welcome was a warm one. It was by now clear enough that the siege could no longer be maintained, and indeed, Orders had already been received that all commandos were to evacuate their positions around Ladysmith after dark. Our wagons were standing packed, but at the last moment it was found that someone had levanted with the transport mules, so everything had to be burned. It came on to rain heavily by nightfall. Peals of thunder growled across the sky and, wet to the skin, we stood huddled against the storm in depressed groups, awaiting our far final orders. At last, long after dark, Field Cornet Sereberg gave the word that we were to move off to Ilantlachte, some 20 miles to the rear. It was an inky night with rain in torrents, through which we had to feel our way, and thus we turned our backs on Lady Smith, for good and all. No march order was attempted, we were simply told to go, and it was left to each man to carry out his own retirement. At the outset, we travelled in company with many others, but as I knew a shortcut, threading the hills to the railway depot at uh, Moderspreit, my brothers and I decided to go thither, for we saw no use in floundering about in mud and water, and the four of us, with my uncle and our native boy Charlie, branched away by ourselves. We reached the depot after two hours and found shelter under, until daybreak, after which we rode on. 
The rain now stopped and the sun rose warm and bright, but it looked on a dismal scene. In all directions, the plain was covered in a multitude of men, wagons and guns, plowing across the sodden felt in the greatest disorder. Whenever a sprite or nulla barred the way, there arose fierce quarrels between the frightened teamsters, each wanting to cross first, with the result that whole parks of vehicles got their wheels so interlocked that at times it seemed as if the bulk of the transport and artillery would have to be abandoned, for the mounted men pressed steadily on without concerning themselves with the uh, convoys. Had the British fired a single gun at this surging mob, everything on wheels would have fallen into their hands. But by great good luck, there was no pursuit. And towards afternoon, the tangle gradually straightened, straightened itself out. Our little family party remained behind with a number of others as a rear guard. And we did not reach Ilan's laughter until late that night. This place had been the chief supply center for the Natal forces, and there were still huge quantities of stores that had been left to the enemy. These were burnt, lighting a conflagration that must have been visible for 50 miles around. By now the, the ruck of the retreat had passed on, and next day we rode along leisurely, climbing up the, the Washbank Valley to uh, Glencoe near Dundee by the following evening. Here were stray remnants of almost every commando that had been in Natal, but things were in such confusion that most of the army had uh, continued straight on. And there was scarcely a man who could tell us what had become of his officers, or what we were supposed to do next. Mr. Sierabar, however, was at Glencoe when we got there, and uh, during the next few days he succeeded in collecting about 300 Pretoria men, while more drifted back later on, as did stragglers from the other commandos. Until after a week, or 10 days, there was quite a respectable body of men, numbering well over 5,000. During this time, my brothers and I, with our uncle, subsisted on what we could loot from the supply trains at the station, for there were practically no commissariat arrangements. But by raiding the trucks at night, we did not do too badly. After a while, General Boerta reorganized everything, and a new line of defense was established along the forward slopes of the Biggersbergen, to which all available men were marched. We of the Pretoria Commando were assigned a post on the shoulder of the mountain, to the right of where the Washbank Valley reaches the plain below. And yeah, we lay amongst pleasant scenery, from which we looked regretfully over the wide sweep of country to the south, from which we had been driven. But we enjoyed the spell of peace and quiet after the turmoil of the past weeks.